they studied they were working on uh, previously in our company. And for that, I'm just giving you a quick introduction of myself. And I'm Wei Min. I'm a data scientist in MSD in Singapore. And my projects are really focused on uh, applied machine learning in drug discovery research and also advanced analytics in, in the marketing and uh, other uh, finance departments. So today the case study I'm going to show is the is actually ad um, adapted from the, the real one that I, I've been working on before. Uh, but the thing is the data is all in the data lake, so it's a priority data set. So the data set I'm showing here is actually a Volcup data set. So which means, unfortunately, you're not able to use your laptop to follow up the tutorials. But the idea is to give you um, um, some demos so that in the future, hopefully, you can easily copy paste the codes for your, like, uh, your own uh, PySpark projects. So and the workflow is going to be like this. I'm going to uh, give a basic background of the, of the questions that we'll try to solve and the data sets. Then I'll be covering like uh, four parts. Data pre-processing using PySpark. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the second part is using a uh, ML um, library for, uh, especially random forest for um, binary classification problem. Then we try to find out how to use AUC score to actually test the model performance, and finally. We talk about one of the challenges in the data sets, which is very unbalanced, and how we can handle that <coughs> in PySpark. OK, so the question we're trying to answer is, what is the probability that a given pro customer will like a certain product? So the data sets actually have two parts, the products features and the customer's features. So what we want to predict is the probability that this customer will like this product based on all the features. And um, so this is just an um, overview of the data sets, of the mock-up data sets we, we are using here. So we, some, we see some of them are continuous variables, some of them are categoricals. And the uh, feedback column is a column we need to predict, which is a binary um, uh, categor categorical column. OK, so let's start. It. OK, the first step we do is load the libraries. And we, as we can see, we have Spark, uh, ML libraries. We have even pandas, but may not, we may not really need pandas for this uh, tutorial. And then we have NumPy, uh, some other uh, libraries. So OK, at this step, we're assuming that, OK, in the company, this is how it works. So you have a data, big data team that help you to set up the platform. Then you have an IT team, a traditional IT team, who will help you pre prepare the data sets and give you whatever views or tables you need. And then you, as a data scientist, just to sit down here and write Python scripts to do processing, modeling, and show them the results so <coughs> to actually demo your POC. And we're assuming that we have all data sets ready. And that's, why, that's, that's how we can load our data sets into a PySmart data frame by using this line. And then we are selecting the features from the table that we will do further processing and modeling. So I'm actually naming all the features here. And then you just you drop, simply drop the duplicates from the, from the table. Then we start with uh, zoom in. OK. How? <laughs> OK. So is this, is this OK? OK, good. OK, so the first step is that we want to see what the, actually the target column distribution <coughs> looks like. So. Because as I mentioned, the target column is supposed to have two categories. It's one is negative and one is positive, right? And um, with a simple bar plot, we can see that it has actually several categories, neutral, negative, and positive. This is very real in, in, the, in, the, I mean, in the real world problem. Because we, first of all, the data set is very skewed. We, see, uh, we have a lot of positive cases, but which, is a good, which is a good indicator that people are liking our products. But on the other hand, we have too few negative cases, which will be hard to train our model, because we do not have e not enough information for the negative cases. And we have a, quite a lot of neutral cases. So one of the ways we can do is that, because the, the, the challenge is to differentiate the positive from the negative, 
or other cases. So why don't we just group the neutral and the negative together? So that's, that's what we, uh, exactly what we do here. So this few line illustrate the purpose here. So firstly, we do a group by count to find out what is the count for each category in the feedback column. Then this response will be a list of rows. And then we further take out the category and the counts and do a, a bar plot. Then that's what you see here. Then the next step is that, because like I mentioned, I want to group all the neutral and negative together so that eventually I have two categories. Of course, I will drop the non um, rows so that eventually we end up with two categories. And this is what we do. In, in PySpark, you will find out a lot of cases you have to use UDF, which is your user-defined functions. And it's actually quite easy to do. So first of all, you have to um, define your own function, which is binarize. Um, after that, actually, there's a typo here. So after that, you pass to the function called UDF with a function you defined together with the output data type, which is string. So with this UDF, you pass to the function called with column. With column is actually create a new column. And together with the input of the column to the function, finally, we, you will come up with a new column for your data frame, which is DF. The DF, remember, is our original data frame having the data from the table. And for the user-defined function, we are actually convert all the neutral cases to negative cases and leave the positive case unchanged. So that's exactly what it does here. So I think it's quite straightforward. So the next step is to find out all the null values in the categorical columns and also casting the data types properly. Because we have all the columns here, we have selected, and some of them are going to be continuous var variables. So that's why we convert to float and integers by using cast. So that's a column dot cast, then specify the type you want to cast to. And then for the remaining columns, actually, which are actually categorical columns. So I passed to the different and change. And, change. and the next step I, I did was to convert all the null values to um, a, uh, a string called NA, so that the column will no longer have null values. So I think this is quite straightforward as well, then let's move on. After we finish cleaning the data sets, the next step is to see which, co which categorical columns actually have too many categories so that we may think of other strategies to deal with it. The first step is we do is to do a um, count, group by count, to see for each of the categorical columns how many different categories for this, uh, are there in total for this column. So the way you do this is very simple. You just do a distinct count. So the distinct values and the count. Then what we can see here, one of the categories is called product feature three. And it has actually 500 something different categories, which is too many. So one of the way we can deal with the situation is that we can group those minorities into one categories and leaving the majority unchanged. For example, we have 500, but maybe 400 of them are actually minorities. So we can group them to a one category called minority. This is one of the ideas you can do. And the way we do it is, uh, is like this. Again, we have to use UDF. But this part is a bit challenging because this UDF actually will accept two inputs columns. One is a um, category column. Another one is a counts. So like we did before, we have to do a group by count first. We group by this column and do a count. Then after that, um, we join this new data frame to original DF so that we have an additional column called count. With each row, we have a number associated with a, with a category, represent the count of the category in the whole data sets. And after we join the, this column, we have to create our uh, <coughs> user-defined function. As I mentioned, this function will accept two input. The first one is original column, which is a product feature. And second one is a count. So based on the count, we can set the threshold, like 150, to filter out those that are below the threshold and then assign those values to a, a universal minority category 
a string. And after we create this user-defined function, we pass to UDF and specify the output type. Then we just, again, use the same function with column to create a new column called product feature 3 reduced. This will be the product feature 3, but reduced in terms of number of unique uh, categories. And then we pass the UDF to it and specify the input columns, which is product feature and count. After that, we will drop the original product feature, which has 500 category, uh, categories, as well as we drop the count columns, which is not useful. OK, so after, after we finish, the last step will be any questions? Here? Yeah, yeah, sure. How have you defined the stress column? Sorry? The stress column. Why is this one? Oh, OK, that's the question. 1,000. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, OK, the story is that I did another plot to see the, the, um, for each of the categories, how many counts associated with different categories. Then I found out that 150 is a good threshold so that I can filter out around roughly around 400 cat, uh, categories. But it's just because the data sets in the cloud, I couldn't run in here, so I couldn't actually show you. But what you have to do is do, um, do a bar plot for each of the categories to see the counts. And if you feel like 150 is good enough to reduce uh, enough categories, then yes, you just use that. what is the purpose? The purpose oh, okay. is to uh, collapse it to some amount of categories. For example, you, I want to have only eight categories in Oh, no, no. Or it is a yeah, percentage yeah. over all the collection. This is actually the threshold, the count of the category, uh, below which the count of the category will be considered as a minority. No, this is what I understood. I mean, uh, the purpose of it, to reduce oh. the amount of categories, correct? Yes, because like, we have 500 different categories, right? Yeah. Some of them may only appear three times, five times, 10 times. For all of these, I group them together to form a minority category. OK, just answer my question. What is the amount of categories that you have under the 500 to in total. Like in total, 100, but after this transformation, how many? Uh, it's times? around 100 uh, something. 100 something? Yeah, 100 something. It's not 10, it's not 12, and it is not, <coughs> OK, it's 100. Yes, 100 something, because I feel like I don't want to have too many. 200 okay. is too many for me. Okay. I just use 100 something. But I didn't show here, yeah, that's a good point. So. What this will achieve is that after you run this function, this original column called product feature three will only have a hand or something unique category left. Yep. I think maybe the question is, what's the problem with having so many categories? Oh, OK. Yeah, that's a good question. Because no, um, it's not a problem why it is so many categories. I mean, <laughs> we don't want to have 500 categories. Yeah. yeah. But how many categories do we want to have? Uh, if you increase this threshold, for example, 350, it will be something like 70. Yeah. If you increase it for 800, it will be probably 20. What is the optimal amount of categories that we want to okay. have, and how to choose yeah. this strategy properly? Actually, two of you have two different concerns, both of which are reasonable. So for your concern is that, how many categories should we have, at a, which is a reasonable amount? This will, you know, on one hand, depends on your data. Because if you find out that the top 100 categories actually have quite a lot, and the 100 and ones category onwards will like sub substantially below a threshold. This differentiation, if, if it is very obvious, so probably 100 will be a good threshold, right? So it's all depending on your data. So you can plot it and see, OK, th maybe this onwards will all become a minority. It looks good on the data sets and distribution. So then that is how I set the threshold. Or if you think 100 is, a, is a, the maximum number of categories you want to have for random forest. Because random forest, sometimes if you have too many, it doesn't make sense to train a model. Then in that way, which is his concern, then you can use Hendra as a threshold. So it's all up to what your concern is and how your data looks like. Okay. So the next part, which is the final part of the data processing, is called one-hot encoding. So how many of you are actually familiar with one-hot encoding and know what it does? So. OK, so maybe I explain a little bit about one hot encoding. Because for all category, cat, uh, categorical features, right, we cannot just push to the model to let the model train <coughs> out. Because eventually, the input data for the model is a matrix of numerical values. So in order to convert the categorical columns, like um, the cities or your sex or gender, which are categorical values, you have to convert into a number. 
And there are two ways you can convert a categorical value to a number. One way is just to use an integer to represent. Like, uh, like uh, Singapore will be one, like uh, New York will be two, and et cetera. This is one of the ways. But this way is not the best way because there's no like, ordering relationship inside. Like New York is not two times of Singapore. But another, so another way which is good is called one-hot encoding, which is if, you, if your column have like 10 different categories or 10 cities, you will end up as 10 columns. And for each row, you will only have one uh, number, at, which is one, which is associated with a column uh, corresponding to the city. So you have 10 columns. All of them, nine of them will be zero. Only one of them will be one. If, you're, if this row is, like for example, Singapore, or, then the, this column represent to Singapore will be one. So this is the idea of one hot encoding which is just to con convert your categorical columns into a, into a number form, numerical form, so that your model can, can, uh, can train out. But unfortunately, in PySpark, it's a bit hard to actually do one-hot encoding compared with Pandas or other packages. So the first step we have to do is use this called a uh, string indexer to index the string into a label indices. So originally, you have a strings, like Singapore, New York, which is a string. Then you use this to convert a, to a label indices, one, two, three, four, five. After that, you pass to this one-hot encoder to actually convert the indices into the one-hot column, one -hot encoding columns, which is a sparse columns. So th this is the step you have to do it. The first thing you have to specify the columns which are categorical columns, and you want to do one-hot encoding. Then you just choose another name for each <coughs> column after it's, it has been converted. For example, feature three reduce, you want to name it feature three reduce cat back. Then you have the two lists. After that, you pass to one list. For each of the input from the, the original columns, you use one-hot encoder. You use it at the input column for the one, uh, string indexer and output column, then this, this output will further pass to the encoder, one-hot encoder function as input. Then the output from the one-hot encoder will be eventually be your one-hot encoding columns or sparse columns. So this is very tedious, I know, but there's no other way we can do this in PySpark. If you know, you, just, you can just let me know. So, so it's a sequence, it's like you, you pass original column to, index, uh, to string indexer, then from the, use the output from the string indexer to go to the one-hot encoder function. Then use the output from the one-hot encoder as your final output column. So two steps. So because I want to make it as a pipeline, so that's why I uh, flatten the, the string so that it will be like step by step for each of these columns. If you find out it's not easy to understand, in the future, just copy paste this code it will do one-hot encoding for your columns. OK, so the last step. Now you have all the features. After like, this tedious feature engineering part, you finally can do a modeling using random forest to train on your data sets and make predictions. One step before that is you have to select, you have group all the features into one column and to let the model know, OK, these are the amount of features I want you to train as the predictors. And this specific column, which is feedback column, is a, is a target column you have to predict on. So you have to let your model know this. And in order to do this, you have to use a function called vector assembler. And the input is the list of the names of the columns that you want to use as predictors. This is very straightforward. All of these columns are, we have seen it before, these are the features we have created or from the original uh, columns. Then you have to specify the output column. Uh, uh, this is to specify a name, features, which represent all of the columns. A uh, second step is to use a label, uh, to create a label indexer. And here you have to use a string indexer function. And the input to this is a binary response, which is a, which is a target column you want to predict. And you have to specify the output column, give a name, label. After you finish this, remember the temp is a pipeline that we have created previously. So you want to add these last two steps into the pipeline as the final two steps. 
and then eventually you can come up with your pipeline. So the pipeline is like you go through step by step of your feature engineering all the way until these two last steps. So if you are familiar with scikit-learn, you will know that a lot of the functions have the fit and the transform. Uh, a lot of the class have fit and transform functions. This is exactly the same here as scikit-learn. So remember the DF is your data frame. After you create your pipeline, you fit and transform on your data frame. It will go through all the, all the steps you have to specify previously until the end. And after that, I want to cache my data. Because eventually, um, I have to do a lot of like, assembling or assembling or ensemble so that I don't want to, the PySpark to redo these steps again and again. So that's why I cache my data in the, in the memory so that the output will be used directly. And then I do a split because I want to test my model's performance. So I, I use 20% of the data as test data and 80% as the training data. And I remember to set a seat here so that every time you do the same split. Then I just want to look at the distribution of the negative and the positive labels in the training data. So it will be like this. It is the same uh, ratio as we have seen before. It's around like y to 1 to 5 or 1 to 4. OK, finally, you have created um, your data sets ready for modeling, which is a training data sets. Remember, this is a pure numerical matrix. There's no strings, no nothing, uh, no categorical features. And this will be your input to train your random forest model. But before that, you have to specify your random forest model to let the model know that feature columns represent a whole bunch of features in the data sets. And the column called label is uh, the target column you want to predict. And there's one or there's a few uh, parameters for random forest. One of them is the number of trees which you have to set specify. After that, you use the same way fit on your training data. Then you predict, which is called transform in this package on the test data sets. So the transformed will be a list of predictions for your test data sets. So until here, we have finished the processing and modeling part. So any questions about that? So now you, wanna, now you, want, you would like to see the performance of your model on the test data sets. Because this is a binary classification problem, one of the ways you can test your model is using AOC score, which is and as a curve. And this score is normally between 0 0.5 and 1, where 0 0.5 is like you flip a coin to randomly assign a prediction, where one means like it's perfect, correlated, or is, uh, the accuracy is perfect. So this is what um, we can easily do this by in, import this uh, matrix from MLA evaluation called um, binary classifier matrix. Then remember this transformed is actually a list of predictions we have, we have got from the random forest on the test data sets. And we select the <coughs> specific probabilities and the labels, the, which is a ground truth. Then we, um, we get all the labels and the probabilities. We pass to the matrix, and it will give a score, which is 0 0.64, which is not very good. But there could be other reasons, like uh, the data set is not very good or the model is not very good. But it's still OK. La. I mean, compared with um, 0 0.5, it improves by 0 0.14. So, and if you want to visualize your AOC score, you can also easily do this, which is the same way as you can do in scikit-learn package, just to um, use, um, use your map plot lab, uh, plotting features. You can, you can plot the AOC score, which is like this. So these areas represent the information or the advantage your model have gained over this area, which is random guessing. So this, this area means like 0 0.14. One four something, yeah. So okay, after you have fi uh, finished this step, we have come to the last step of this tutorial, which is to, which is to deal with um, unbalanced problem. Because remember, in the, from the beginning, we found that data sets very unbalanced. We have much more positive cases compared with negative cases. Unfortunately, we cannot do much more uh, in the random forward package on PySpark because we do not have the class balance uh, implemented in the random forest. As far as I know, I don't, I don't think they have this. So unlike other packages like Secular, which is more robust, and you can do a lot of, uh, um, you have 
a lot of features. So what we do can do here is um, manually do, uh, down sampling or sub, uh, up sampling. Down sampling means that because we have too many positive cases, two more positive cases and negative cases, so we can just take a sample of the positive cases and keep all the negative cases. So we can bring down the ratio between the positive and negative cases. This is, this is called down sampling. So this is just distribution to see the outputs, which is uh, not too much to talk about. And so let's, talk, let's uh, see how we can do down sampling. First, we specify the, the ratio of the positive cases to negative, ne negative cases, because we want to bring down the ratio. So we can specify the ratio is 2, which means the number of positive cases to the number of negative cases is 2, points, uh, two, two to 1. And we will keep all the negative cases, because it's a m minority uh, cases. Then we do a group by, same as we have done before. Group by the, uh, the positive and negative. Then we can get a count for each positive and negative. Then we, s we calculate the ratio. OK, so this, is a, this part is a bit tricky. Because um, the way I use is that for each of the positive cases, I will random assign an integer within a bound. Then I use a threshold that I have calculated for all those rows wh whose um, whose random integer is below this threshold, I'll, tr I'll, uh, I'll keep it. For all those cases whose random integer were above the threshold, I'll throw it, throw it away. So the one remaining will be roughly around 2 to 1 in terms of numbers. And this part will, will help you take care of this. Then eventually your DF sub subsample data will be a subset of your training data with a reduced amount of positive cases. Then you use this data sets to retrain your random forest and make predictions. And you realize, OK, it's improved a little bit, which is 0 0.646. So by using this way, you can increase your results a little bit. And another way is a, a bit trickier way that you can do, even do an example of downsamplings. Because every time you do a downsampling from the positive cases, you waste quite a amount of positive cases. So what you can do is you do like multiple times of downsampling. Every time you take a different subset from the positive cases, then you do 10 times. And take, um, then you will get 10 predictions. From those 10 predictions, you take the average, which is <coughs> ensemble. And hopefully, this will be better than one time of downsampling. Let's see how it works. This code is a bit more. Uh, I mean, compl complicated, so I'm not going to go through this. But the basic idea is you, you have done like 10 times of downsampling. For each time, you get a prediction, and you average them. And let's see what the resu results look like. So the first time without downsampling is 0 0.645, and then it increase, 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 increase. So ensemble actually helps a bit compared with the previous um, downsampling one time. So yeah, so these are the two strategies that you can you can actually uh, play with when you have an unbalanced data set. But there could be other ways you can do this, but there's just like some possible ways that can help you do this. So like I said, you don't have to fully understand like all of this. How does this work? You just copy paste, and it will do the job for you, <laughs> hopefully, for your future PySpar projects. Um, actually, based on my experience working with PySpar, it's not very easy compared with. It's much more hard. Um, like much harder to compare with using Py uh, pandas and uh, other packages. But why do you still need PySpark? <coughs> well, one of the obvious reasons is that you have too much data. You cannot fit into your laptop, or you need a cluster to do this. So at this moment, I think the PySpark documentation is quite limited. And also, uh, the package is not very, it's not a lot. There's a very few packages, and random forest only in the basic implement with its basic features. But, so that's why we have to do a lot of extra um, work in order to in enhance the performances. But hopefully, this can give you an idea of what can you do with PySpark. So yeah, with that, I finish the tutorial. And if you have any questions, you can ask. Mm -hmm. Which version is Spark? Oh, which version? Sorry, uh, actually, I can't remember. Yeah. It should be right, uh, around that, because the last time they update was last year, because that is when I finished the project. 
Sorry, I, I can't remember. Yeah, but it's it's not the latest one. Yeah. Yeah, it should be zero point six. But at that time, there's no like class balance for random forest, and you cannot even get feature importance for all of random forest models, unlike pandas. And um, yeah, so I think yeah, just forty minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, downsizing. If I have negative two and ten positive, double it. I just random sample from here. For uh, why do you have to go through that long step? Oh yeah, because you have to random sample from your positive cases, right? Mm -hmm. So how sample how do you random sample? You must because there's no function that you can help. You just call it. That's why I'm saying keep saying like PySpar is not very easy oh, okay. uh, for a lot of things. Yeah, so. There's no, not even a random sample feature function. A lot of functions will be missing. So that's why when you are actually working with a parse project, you have headache along the way. So that's why hopefully this will give you life easier. Yeah. I have one question. I am just started to explore PySpark. Mm -hmm. yeah. And could you provide some of your experience? What are the limitations of PySpark compared to classical scheduler narrative? Like pan pandas or secular, right? Yes, yes. Maybe the for example, if this is okay. your requirements, you should not use PySpark. That's actually a very good question, but the thing is, um, okay, the one sentence answer is that there are so many disadvantages and, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying PySpark is not good. It's a open source project, so, and, how say uh, you cannot compare with pandas because pandas and the uh, secular are so well developed, right? If you compare with that, you see oh, PySpark is like even not even ten percent as good as that one. So, but for some cases, you have no other ways but you have to use PySpark. Like I mentioned, you have too much data, right? You cannot fit on your laptop unless you have a very large HPC, which have a lot of RAM. <coughs> you have to come to a cluster. And you only know Python, for example. You don't know uh, Scala, so you have to use PySpark. And I don't think the Py, uh, Spark R is as good as PySpark, so you can expect a lot more disadvantage if you use Py, uh, uh, Spark R. So that's the reason I finally end up with PySpark. But after I finish all, all of these obstacles, I feel like uh, even though it's very hard to work with, but if you can understand the logic, because it's very different from, from other uh, packages, like the lazy evaluation thing, right? So you have to understand some basic uh, building blocks of Spark, then you can uh, step by step work your way to finish your projects. And one of the ways is to use other people's code. So this is, this is very important. Like even a si like simple step, you, you have to think of, uh, you have to use a lot of ways to uh, work around to, to accomplish that, where you, in pandas or other, you just use one line, you can finish the job. So that's why you have a lot of limitations. And, but be careful if you are eventually want to give up and convert to pandas data frame. That's going to be another huge issue because you'll blow up, you'll blow up your whole memory. Yeah. So because sometimes I just want to, I don't want to spend much any more time, I just convert to pandas data frame. Then I receive an email from my big data team Hey, you are actually cause the whole cluster to stop because you're <laughs> using all the RAM. So that's the thing, right? Because your data set is very large, you cannot even use one data frame to store it. I mean, the pen, the pen data frame. So there's no way you can do that. But for small data sets, you can convert to pen data frame, then do a quick, a quick calculations, which will make your life much easier. But make sure the data frame is very small. So yeah, the one of yeah. How much is flat? Sorry? How much is flat? Yeah. It depends on your RAM because this you have to negotiate and work closely with your big data team. It's all up to them. It's like because it's not just you, there are many other projects who are sharing the skills or resources, right? So, so no it's hard to say, yeah. For with one million rows or it doesn't it doesn't matter on the rows, it matters on the size of the data. Like the gigabytes or terabytes. So it depends on how much data set you have. If you only have like ten gigabytes, there's Absolutely no reason to use this. Don't get in trouble. And yeah. If it's one gigabyte, now the mo like modern laptop have like 16 gigabytes, right? Why why not just use a laptop? Why why you like want to spend all the trouble using this big data platform? So it's always you, the first question you have to ask yourself: Why do I need a big data platform? 
right? It's not because everybody using it, everybody talking about it, you have to use it. That's not a good way. So think about your challenge. Think about your data sets. Do you really need it? Then you have to, then you, then you can come to this uh, platform. Okay. How big was the size of your data? I'm not sure if you Sorry? mentioned that. How big was the size of your data? Uh, it's around 100 gigabytes for, for this particular task. And how long did it take to run your full notebook? Uh, it's actually quite long. <laughs> yeah, because the resources is very limited. It's only for POC, right? So they, they don't give you too much, uh, too many executors or like, um, so you, it's actually not very fast. So it takes a few hours. Sometimes it can take a few hours, yeah. Or even not finish. So it depends on your resources. This is very, varies a lot. So it, it's, it's hard to say, yeah. If you, Tuning the two parameters. Tuning the two parameters. So you could oh. have actually tuned yeah, the yeah, yeah. Sense. So the parameters, one of the thing. 200 is already quite a lot. Sometimes I have to use 50 for the number of trees because you cannot finish. So, um, so that's why one of the parameters you have to be careful is the number of trees you want to run, run for. The more trees, the longer time it will take. But would it be appropriate to tune like, the number of trees? Actually, I don't think it matters much, at least for my data sets. Because random forest, the good thing, or the only good thing we use random forest is because it's easy and no much parameter to tune, compared with AgiBoost or other models. So you just have to specify 100 trees, which should be enough for, for many cases. The maximum 1,000 trees, but I don't think it's necessary. Use consideration was actually the lack of parameter yeah, it's a, one of the considerations, of course. Yeah, like I said, the 200 is it's already maximum that I, I, I can afford. Otherwise, it's not going to finish within one day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for random forest, right, for each tree, uh, you assign a random subset of uh, samples and a subset of a random subset of features. Sorry? For each tree. No, I mean, the down sampling is only. Okay, sorry. Uh, the thing is, when I was doing <coughs> down sampling, right? Every time I get a subset of the data sets, right, I run one random forest. Then I get another subset and run, run random forest. So one subset. Are they using the same uh, subset? No, they are not using the same. No, OK. You are saying the, the algorithm itself, right? Yeah. No, no, they are doing um, <coughs> uh, bootstrap sampling out of your data sets. Then gonna, there's going to be some samples, which is called all, all of back uh, samples. For every time you. Is that the. Uh, like, is there any parameters that you I don't think you can set any more parameters. No, no, the, the random forest package is very basic. Um, if you go to the random forest uh, pack, uh, documentation of the PySpark, you'll see that. Uh, I don't think you can set that. Yeah, I don't think. Because of, it's very basic, you only can set the number of trees, the total number of trees, and number. Uh, of columns you, you, you use to uh, sample from your total columns. So beyond that, I, uh, yeah, you can check the random for documentation, but I don't think yeah, you can do that. OK, so I think that's, yeah, usually. Uh, at the end of your book, you measured the accuracy of 6.64, right? And yeah. that took you a lot of time to, to achieve. What were some of the key steps that helped you improve your performance the most? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Okay. If your business user or your stakeholders actually very curious about the accuracy, they want you to push it a, a little bit, then you really have to think about what can be the ways to actually increase it, because this is not very high. Very high. Um, OK, so one of the ways you can get more features. Like I mentioned <coughs> in the beginning, right? We, what the feature we have is like product feature and customer feature. Of course, this is a demo, but the thing is, this can res like, um, be similar to many real world cases. So from the product feature, you can get even more features, right? So, and the customers, for example, we only have the basic, the region, the type, the, the, the job type, and the, the gender of the customer. We can even get more features, like how frequently the customer come to, our, uh, to buy our products, and how many years this customer has been our loyal customer to our, uh, to our company. And even beyond that, we can even do a, a lot of feature engineering. Um, like we can do a group by, for example, group by this customer to count how many products this guy totally buy, or how many times they give a positive feedback out of negative feedback. Those kind of additional extra features will definitely increase your model's accuracy. But 
unfortunately, it's very hard to even create one features in PySpar, so I don't want to go into that error. <laughs> yeah, so I always try to avoid those kind of sophisticated things to do in PySpar. But of course, that way will definitely increase your accuracy a lot. Yeah. So I think with that uh, time, yeah, sure. Uh, in PySpark, I think there is ML and ML unique, right? Yeah. Which one are you using? Uh, actually, OK, I, I'm not very familiar with what's the difference. But the thing is, I'm, I'm using ML, yeah. But I'm also using some other like um, uh, tools from ML, uh, MLE. For example, the, for example, this one, um, the AUC score, yeah, this one. So the model is from ML and feature engineering. But honestly, I don't, I don't know the difference. I, I think they're quite similar. No, no, I think they should be very similar. I, I, can, I can't really tell the difference between those two, yeah. So yeah, I think that's all OK for my part. Any, any questions? <laughs> OK, yeah, sure. Do you have trouble in saving and loading the model? Sorry? Do you have trouble in saving and loading the model? Survey or loan? Survey. Saving and loading. Saving. Oh, OK. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, so OK, this is um, for some other projects, right? For example, you have a class of handle machines to run your random forest. And eventually, the random forest model size will be very, very large. It's going to be a few gigabytes. So it's, it's going to be a trouble and concern for you to think about uh, how you can carry the model along. And every time you want to make prediction, you have to load the model from the disk. So that is definitely the concern you have to worry about. If you have a large cluster, you have a lot of data. But for this one, I don't think my cluster is very large. So that's why it takes a few hours to finish the random forest. So I don't think it's a big problem for, to save the model. I actually, I haven't tried that. I just save the model in the server every time I, I actually, I retrain it because it takes a few hours to finish training. So I, I don't reuse the model from the, but I don't think it's a big problem. But of course, when you have a large cluster, which is a case that I, we had previously, the model gun, size can be very large. And so that's also another reason you should come to IGBoost or other models. Yeah, random forest is very large. OK, so yeah. Maybe. Any more questions for Vivian? Okay, good. Um, let's hear for Vivian.